because this is predominantly a defence-interested audience, I'll first of all spell out how I see the situation in very shorthand terms on defence and then go into this challenge that we face now. I am very depressed about the uh, level of commitment that the UK is making to defence in many different areas. I understand that we have gone through a very difficult economic period and that we have to take account of that in any aspirations we have for the defence budget. I'm a realist. I'm making demands for the National Health Service. You may have noticed quite frequently. And uh, I can't have it both ways. But I have no doubt that successive governments took far too relaxed a view of what was potentially likely to happen in the world when the Berlin Wall fell down. And I also have no doubt that very serious mistakes have been made about how to handle Russia uh, ever since we gave commitments to Gorbachev, which, let's be quite clear about it, had one and only one implication. We will not push NATO right up to the boundaries of the Russian Federation. And the significance of that and the importance of that for whoever is in the Kremlin is considerable, and we should remember it. And we should remember the words of that great American diplomat who actually, in 1946, in his famous telegram, spelled out the policy which we all successfully followed of containment of the superpower that was then in charge of Russia, the Soviet Union. Now, let's look at the British commitment, because it really matters. Uh, I can't help but say this with Admiral West in the audience, that I was slightly surprised by the size of the two aircraft carriers they built, but perhaps I was rather too influenced by the way when I was uh, chairman of the Admiralty Board that we moved the battleship that we had been granted in the wake of the defense review to a command center in the center of the ship and an aircraft and a helicopter carrying vessel to being a full-blown aircraft carrier with uh, a Hawker jet, a, 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 what were they called? The V-Stall, anyhow, Harrier jets. So that was always, I look back, as a triumph of uh, political diplomacy. Dennis Healy was well aware of what we were doing on the Admiralty Board, but it could not have been done without the charm of Mike Lefnew. I look at the Army with huge pride about what has been done in uh, developing and expanding and increasing the role of the SAS, and I think it is a formidable achievement, and I think we are first among perhaps some equals, but not many. And I think the way the Air Force have adjusted to all these changes has been uh, considerable. But the room for further cuts, in my view, is non-existent, and I think we must now face up to the reality of what is happening on defense. Now, I will mention Obama and what I'm formally going to say a little bit, but I'm not here to spend too much time on him. But uh, I, I do think he's slightly demob happy. But the issue on which I take exception is his Telegraph article, which presumably he did read before signing it. And that was right at the end when he says that the uh, responsibility for uh, peace and prosperity in Europe was the United States and the European Union. Now, I say to you in all seriousness, there's not been a single president since Truman was president in 1949 when NATO was first brought about that would have said that. Not one of them would say it. And I think it is very revealing of an attitude of mind that is in the White House, that has probably been in the State Department for much longer, and if we're not careful, will soon be coming in the Department of Defense. Because the people who are most disillusioned with this uh, transparent fraud of European defense are the young colonels who came in and watched this process. I will deal with this in a little bit more detail. I think there has never been a time when we could lose congressional support for NATO it's amazing, really, that it's lasted all these years. Amazing. But it is the cornerstone of our defense. 
absolutely the cornerstone of our defense. And I think if we allow that to slip away, then I think it would be very serious. And I think there is only one country at this moment in time in Europe that can stop it slipping away. I don't deny it might be at a later stage, if we're still around, uh, could be Germany who would be listened to in the same way and has got the resources to spend. But they're not spending them now, nor is France. But France has a different ambition for NATO, which is to diminish its uh, effectiveness and its resource and to build up this so-called European defense. Now, in this climate, ask yourselves, wherever you come out on this debate, this is not about, I'll come to that later, leave that as a separate parcel, whatever position you're in. If you're concerned about European defense, ask yourself, how do you steady this movement to diminish the U.S. commitment to defense? They ain't going to go on spending 73 or 75% of NATO's budget, depending on which calculation you use. They're just simply not going to. And what's more, there's no politician who can win a presidential election uh, saying that they're going to go on doing that. So, and Obama was right to put up a thing and call us freeloaders. We are freeloaders. We in this country, to a less extent than most others, but we are freeloading. And this has got to stop. And I personally believe that it will only stop when we call European Union defense for what it is, a sham, a fraud, and a very serious danger to this country. And I have watched the salami tactics as this has moved on, and I will describe it later. But irrespective of the vote, irrespective of that decision, just on purely defense grounds, no further cuts, as soon as we can possibly afford to it, put more resources in, take the Ministry of Defense apart and analyze why they have made so many mistakes in the last 20 years and particularly in the last 10 years. Ask yourself, who is going to stop this process of creating a weapon system and changing it month by month, year by year, adding to the cost and refusing to face the discipline? And people say it can't be done. It can be done. There was an admiral called, I think his name was Admiral McGeer, who was Polaris uh, officer in charge of the Polaris program, who kept that program to budget and to time with absolute harshness and refusal to accept even sometimes rational claims. I remember him telling me, I'm turning down, he said, demands which I totally agree with. But I know what will happen. It will add to the cost, and it will add to the time that it will come on stream. And we need it on stream on time, and we dare not lose our reputation by destroying the cost estimates. There is no reputation for the Ministry of Defense inside the Treasury these days. They've always been pretty critical, pretty difficult to deal with. But now, they don't trust you. And the final sign has been the way they've handled the... Uh, Trident replacement and taken this uh, very diff different and difficult decision in the financing arrangements for it, but that's something for the rest. Now, let me begin with a quote from the author of The EU and Obituary. It's by John Gillingham, an American, a very well-known historian at the European Union from the Harvard Center for European Studies, and one of their preeminent historians on the European Union. So let's listen to an American another American. The present crisis of the European Union makes it painfully evident that the history of the EU must be thought, rethought, recast, and rewritten. He goes on to say, Cameron's promise of a better deal for you, Britain has little meaning in respect to an EU in disarray, which is untrustworthy, falling behind economically, and unable or unwilling to deliver on its commitments. At the rock-bottom level, moreover, a sovereign national political system like Britain's, based on the supremacy of parliament, is incompatible with the existence of a supranational entity whose leadership remains, in spite of everything, unwavering in its determination to create a European state. Look at these heads of governments of what they say when they're on the hustings. Look at what they say when they're in their own national political party annual gatherings, and you will find from every one of them, including Angela Merkel, the rhetoric of a European superstate. 
That is what they underlyingly want. You can go on like this, uh, ignoring the text, if you like, but the texts are there, and if you look at the salami tactics that have been used remorselessly, that is what they are aiming at. Now, there are two very different phases in the development of the common market and European community. I think a broadly successful first stage from 1956 to 1942 that ended with the Maastricht Treaty of 1992. Then a second phase, which is only just agreed, remember, in the French referendum in September 92, by so small a margin that that project lacked in France conviction and discipline. And if your major country, certainly your major defense continental country, has that lack of conviction and discipline, it's not a good start. But the start of that phase uh, has been a disaster, but not a word I choose lightly. I have a house in Greece. I have watched the effect on that country and that people during the last six years of the Eurozone crisis. Now, some of it they deserved. Some of it is the responsibility of Goldman Sachs for cooking the books with them when they went into the EU. But the underlying social problem is a warning. You collapse a country's economy, you force them out of the euro, and you do it perhaps in three or four countries, or one country as large as Italy, and you see the effect. Perhaps you haven't seen it. Go to their pharmacies and they're completely empty shelves. Go to your machine to get money and you are limited in any one week how much you can withdraw. Look at their unemployment figures and see the tragedy I'm a social democrat. I am ashamed of the unemployment levels in Spain. 56% at one, 54%, I think I'm right in saying, at one stage for under 25s. Still very high, 30%. Coming down, they claim and hope, by 19, uh, 2017 to 18% or more. Look at the extraordinary uh, unemployment levels in other countries than Portugal, even Ireland, disguised by a very large-scale movement of young people out of Ireland, either to the United States or the rest of Europe or many to this country. Now, these are issues which, as a social democrat, a title to which I still adhere in the House of Lords, I'm ashamed of. And I like to think I was helpful when I was president of the Council of Ministers in laying the foundation for after Greece coming in, then Portugal and Spain. Now, in a recent meeting in Paris at the European Movement, which I went to deliberately because I've, and I think our chairman can pay, attest to this, have never been a federalist. There has only been two and a half years during which uh, the uh, Foreign Office has existed within the EU that I can safely tell you that was the policy of the Foreign Office, and it had to be fought for against a very spectacular resistance from many diplomats who find it much harder to accept a political decisions than admirals, generals, and air marshals, in my experience. Now, in France, Michel Rocard, one of my oldest friends, former prime minister, lifelong federalist, and a supporter of the uh, European uh, state as soon as possible, and why he wants Britain to leave. I want Britain to leave for a reason that if they want to create a European state, good luck to them. And it's certainly the quickest and the shortest way of overcoming the Eurozone crisis and having fiscal transfers and the rest of them. But what was fascinating in this meeting of the European movement in France, not one of the three main speakers before me mentioned the Eurozone and the Eurozone crisis. They are in denial. You look at the French newspapers, the amount of coverage they give for the Eurozone crisis is very small indeed. It's barely admitted. Now, I believe that this issue of the Eurozone has got to be faced, and nobody has faced it more openly, more honestly, or in a, uh, almost wittily than the former chairman of the Bank of England in his book, Mervyn King's book, The End of Alchemy, which says in a nutshell, the Euro crisis will continue. First, important assumption. Secondly, the collapse of the euro is inevitable. And thirdly, a qualification 
unless there is a system of fiscal transfers and the emergence of what is to all intents and purposes a country called Europe. No one can predict when or how exactly this series of events takes place. Perhaps the greatest danger is that in a time warp of its own, the EU and the Eurozone will lumber on much longer than any of us think or expect, irresolute, undecided, with a malfunctioning Euro, a dysfunctional EU, and increasing economic stagnation. That may be the most realistic, and yet almost the most depressing of all the outcomes. Against this, the UK will suffer. Do not believe that because we're not in the Euro, we somehow got a safeguard of it. We don't have to dismantle the Euro within our own country, which is fortunate. But with your neighbors in disarray, don't think you can get out of this. So uh, let us also remember that the US will be, the global world will be affected by it, but none of them as much as the UK. Uh, and so we have to then ask, what does common prudence tell you? What is your responsibility to your country? And at this stage, I think there is nothing that the UK can do within the EU structure to avoid such an outcome. For the last six years, President Obama and his financial secretary have written, rung up, and gone to the Eurozone on innumerable times to get it changed. No response at all. The same for the UK. Whatever my views or criticisms may be of the Prime Minister and the Chancellor of the Exchequer on this issue, they've been strong and furthermore generous because they said very early in their government in 2010 that we would not stop that degree of integration which was necessary to keep the euro. And that was the right decision. And it, it is difficult for us. Now we have the opportunity to leave before the temple. And I use the word temple. This is an unreal building that we're watching. It comes crashing down. Every year out of the EU, before there is a collapse or this long-standing inability to deal with the issue, will be years that will damage our citizens. Every year we gain, we will have a greater chance to switch some of our trading and our economic activity out to the global world, where, after all, we did live pretty happily until 73. I mean, this idea that there's no alternative to the European Union, there is such a thing as called the world. Now, I believe you should have good relations with your neighbors, and it's one of the reasons why I've always been a European, and I'm not going to go into my record, but I've sacrificed or risked my political career, actually. I don't think I sacrificed it. Risked it on at least three occasions. Now, to those who say that a British exit from the EU will trigger a Eurozone crisis, I can only say that I doubt it will happen, but of course, I cannot be sure that it will not. I take that decision in the full knowledge that, that might be the consequence. The time has come, I really believe, to put the UK and its interests first. And remember this, this opportunity we have in this referendum has not come to you from, by grace and favor of the politicians. It's been wrung out of the politicians by the people in this country over progressive stages, over, you could argue, well, certainly almost since the revolt in the House of Commons across party lines that very nearly stopped the 1971-72 legislation going through. Now, I played a part in taking that through, through a uh, voting for it in, with 68 other Labour MPs and resigning with Roy Jenkins. Do I regret it? How can you tell the future, you know? It's true there was a possibility of a euro, but I actually did believe, even in 1975, when the uh, stay campaign, led by Roy Jenkins and Ted Heath, and two people who ought to know, signed up to the statement that that issue had been overtaken by events and that there was no risk of monetary union. That's what people did vote on for a referendum which was also called the EEC and the common market on the uh, ballot paper. Now, things move on, but this referendum is a moment to decide. And I want to explain to you why I think it's politically a very opportune moment for us to leave. We can make an orderly change now with an agreed transitional period in the treaties. Some say to vote to remain just because they think a collapse is inevitable and they don't want Britain to be blamed for it. Well, I must say, that's a pathetic answer. 
I am not charged with looking after whether I am blamed for something. Quite often I am blamed for something. Quite frequently I deserve to be blamed for something. But as a politician, you should try to put the best interests of your country. And if it means you have to change your views or alter them in any way, if the facts change, then you should change them. But as I say, I've never been a federalist. And this euro is basically a federalist structure. Now, this referendum is the moment to decide. We, first of all, have an experienced government. It's not the government I would vote for. I hope we can get them out in 2020. We won't get them out just with the Labour Party alone, incidentally. It will be a progressive alliance of other parties. It will have to include the SNP, but I, I don't see any reason with that. Um, but that's my political wish. Others in the audience will want the Conservatives to continue. Well, they might. All I'm saying to you is that you've got an experienced government, and it helps, because these are going to be difficult negotiations, and you go into it with a government that because of the constitutional change of a fixed-term parliament is most unlikely to face a general election for four years. And I think that four years period allows you a transition of three years and then they can fight an election and let the best political party win. That's my attitude, by which time I'll probably be under the sod. Now, of course, if the vote is to leave, the Prime Minister will have to take account in his cabinet of that change and take into the inner negotiating cabinet key figures from the vote leave campaign within his own party. That is exactly how I believe Harold Wilson would have responded in 1975. And I was in his government and there are not many of them around. And I can only tell you this, I am sure he would have put Michael Foote and Peter Shaw and Eric Varley onto that negotiating committee and I think he would have offset it with Jim Callaghan, Dennis Healy, and Merlin Rees. I'm not at all sure he would have put Tony Benn onto that committee. He moved Tony Benn away from industry to energy, if you may remember, and Harold had very considerable reservations about him, and rightly so. I think he'd offset not putting Tony Benn on by not putting Roy Jenkins on, and then also not putting Barbara Castle on that she got other problems with the health service. I can't be sure. Nobody could be sure, but I put it to you, that's the sort of decisions David Cameron may face on the 24th of June, and I very much hope so. Furthermore, the then Cabinet Secretary, I can't be sure about the present one, but the then Cabinet Secretary would have been able to put papers carefully prepared before Harold Wilson by the evening of the vote on the 23rd and he would have been able to assess it overnight and he would be able to make statements based on a objective assessment of what the option was. Mind you, in those days, nobody thought it was going to be no, but I bet you that cabinet secretary would have had the work done in the civil service during the pre-election period. Now, I believe Harold Wilson, furthermore, would have made it clear to the country that he would follow their decision to come out, even though it was not his preference, and implement it in the way that would best suit the country. And in fairness to David Cameron, you may think it's rather a lot of money to spend 9.8 million pounds on a leaflet, but there in the leaflet is a very clear commitment to, and he uses the word implement. And I take him on his word, and I believe he would. He could announce, and should not announce, decisions or negotiating arrangements until a new cabinet subcommittee had met and taken their conclusions, properly worked out in papers, let's stop this SOFA government, let's stop this presidential government, and let's have this decision taken by the cabinet as a whole on informed advice as to how and what steps you take. They're going to be very difficult steps. And I think it's extremely clear that one of the first steps they would have taken is what Callaghan made clear during the referendum when Pat Nairn, actually, who was in the Ministry of Defence, one of our most able civil servants, in my view, of that period, was in the Cabinet Secretariat, and he put a memo to Callaghan, actually during the referendum in May, and said, there's no hurry about the legislation that can wait until the autumn. And back came from Callaghan, who had been vested with responsibility for conducting the referendum politically uh, by uh, Harold Wilson, no. If they vote no then we have a democratic obligation, he said, to look at the legislation and to change the European 1972 European Communities Act. 
And that must be done uh, in certainly as uh, soon as possible. And now that we have a new parliament, uh, she's been prorogued and will have been back in uh, position after that, then we can uh, set about looking at that legislation. And of course we have to do it in consultation with our allies in all respects, Europe and otherwise, and certainly it means talking to the European Commission, uh, who will obviously, the President, play a big area. And we could look at fishing. I like to see the map and we're restoring the waters, which I've sailed happily in all my youth in. Uh, and we will, of course, honor all the old fishing agreements that we've had for centuries with our friends and neighbors. And we will look at the whole question of fishing policy and agricultural policy in as much as it doesn't impinge on the EEA, the European Economic Area. For four years, I've been trying to persuade this Prime Minister and Chancellor of the Exchequer to reform the EEA so that, in all honesty, you don't treat Norway as a second-class country. You let them have full voting rights. Also, instead of this misguided decision to speed up the entry, to speed up the entry of Turkey into the European Union, I mean, even the Home Secretary today, Theresa uh, May has made it abundantly clear that she's questioning any expansion in the present situation of uncontrolled immigration. Now, I personally think Turkey is very important to the subject we're talking about, defense. It would be an absolute tragedy if we were to leave, if Turkey was to leave NATO. I know there are problems on human rights. I know there are problems with the president and the way of the direction of policy. But to have Turkey still in NATO is the last very important link that they have with being in part a European country and in part a NATO, a, a Middle East country. And with all the problems in the Middle East, to have that within the councils of NATO and to have their armed forces and the loyalties and the friendships of their military is extremely important. And I've been urging this for four years. Offer Germany, uh, offer, sorry, uh, Turkey, membership of the European Economic Area and explain to them that it cannot come with freedom of movement of labor. Now we're told that freedom of movement of labor is a founding principle of the uh, Treaty of Rome and the European idea. It is. And we all know who study this carefully that the, within the Treaty of Rome there is language which is aimed at one objective, a supranational European state. And there are other language which is aimed at one objective, not having a European uh, neutral state. I go back to the warning in 1962 when I was a Labour candidate for Torrington, North Devon. The only issue was whether or not I could save my deposit. I'm glad to say two years later I did, just. And at that stage, my leader was Hugh Gateskill, a fine man, and the reason why I joined the Labour Party after his defeat in 1959. He warned this country in prescient words, if this European endeavor means closer and warmer relationships amongst member states, sovereign member states, fine. But if it means that we just become a Texas or a Florida, or you name the states in the United States of America, then it's not for us. And he warned it would be a thousand years of history lost Many people in the Labour Party, including many, I have to say, who are close friends and I've worked with for a long time, Shirley Williams, Bob, uh, Roy Jenkins, and Bill Rogers amongst them, were very upset by this speech. And Nora Gateskill turned to Charlie Pannell, a Labour MP for Leeds, and said, as the left clapped Hugh's speech, the wrong people are clapping. Well, I have to tell you, there was a junior hospital doctor in the Royal Waterloo who was clapping that speech. So I ain't changed my position. Now, maybe it's old-fashioned. I have that discussion with my children, and I have that discussion with many younger people. And maybe in the future date, and one of the things I always said about the Treaty of Rome, it allows for this dream, because sometimes dreams become reality. But we're a long way away from that. So now I come back to this other question. Soundings will have to be taken. We are in no hurry to make immediate decisions. The Prime Minister made a serious error in saying in the House of Commons that I will invoke Article 50. 
Those days are over, Mr. Prime Minister. We now want prime ministers who are answerable to the cabinet, and they don't use the term I until they've discussed it with the cabinet. And I tell you this, that is the lesson that hopefully comes out of the Chilcot Report, whatever else comes out of it, is that we are going to return to the structure of government and the cabinet government that was good enough for Churchill and Attlee in the wartime coalition all through from 1940 to 45. And if it can survive those strains and stresses, then collective cabinet government and proper and open discussion can survive the strains and stresses we may be putting on it in the next few difficult years. And I think we also ought to explore attitudes to Article 8, which is also in the treaties, which talks about relations with neighbors. We are going to be Europeans and stay Europeans, and we are going to be neighbors, and let's think about that. Now, these foreign and defense issues that will come up as a result of this, there are very strong reasons why the British would be better to focus our activity on NATO, which I've dealt with. And I want to say this, that it's completely understandable that the US will only really in their heart make their commitments to NATO if we can convince them that they are wanted, they are needed, and they are respected. Those are the three things that are important. And I don't think they feel in their heart of hearts many of those things at this stage. So who can do it? I've said to you, I think it's only Britain. I think it will be essential that we carry on those existing missions that we do under CFSP, CDSP. They're an integral linkage. One's the defense arm, one's the foreign policy arm. And some of them are doing a very worthwhile job. I'm not going to decry what's been happening in Somalia or some of these other areas. But in almost all cases, they don't actually need Britain. But if they do need Britain, I'm not saying we die in the trench because we're not members of the EU defense policy and the CDSP, that if they wanted us to join us, we wouldn't be able to and wouldn't be ready to do. But our prime need in peacekeeping is the hard peacekeeping tasks. I think it should start with France. I want to see those three sophisticated aircraft carriers put at a uh, call for the UN for a rapid reaction peacekeeping force in circumstances where they need an offshore aircraft carrier. And I think that with three, we can guarantee it. And I also think it should be there ready also for NATO. And what we've got to stop do is double counting, triple counting, and I would say even more than that. What about this European rapid reaction force, never yet seen the dead of day? Because as every American pointed out to them, all you're doing is taking it away from NATO's rapid reaction force. Now, in that sort of language of realism, look at the External Action Service. I'm sure all of you know who it, what it is. That is in embryo, and rather more than in embryo. It's now born, I would say, not quite yet reaching uh, teenage, but still in single figures, but building. I think it will be impossible for us to stop it, because I think the rest of them want it, because it is a symbol of becoming a country. But let us learn from the mistakes. Let us learn from the mistakes of the handling of the Ukraine. I deal with it in the booklet. Perhaps we'll come back to that. Let's learn from the fact that the Dutch in a referendum which everybody tried to ignore, which was lowish poll, but nevertheless voted rejection of the EU-Ukraine EU Association Agreement. That's just about the latest warning. I have never seen a document more crafted to create a confrontation with Russia. I should perhaps say, I've been involved in business in Russia for the last 20 years. I was... Uh, Chairman of UCOS International, I've been involved in steel and uh, in iron ore in Russia. I'm actually now no longer financially in any way committed at all. I'm, so I hope you will give me the feeling that I can talk about Russia without any jingle of money in the pocket. I just give you that. Now, a recent report of the House of Commons Scrutiny Committee has pointed to many ways in which the range and activity of the EAAS are inexorably increasing, and so is the cost. 
The budget for 2012 was just short of 500 million euros. And by 2015, it had spectacularly doubled to 1 billion, just short. There are also now, everywhere you look, embassies and ambassadors. They weren't given that title, but they, of course, assumed it. And nobody stops in its way. At every stage, this uh, creep started under Tony Blair, and particularly with his meeting with President Chirac, um, is effectively a way of creating for a new European country the embassies and diplomatic strength all around Europe. And during this time, what's happened to our own foreign office budget? Slashed to the bone. There's not much room for any further cuts there. And some of the savings we could get from our contribution to the EAS and to the European defense budget, let's split them, what little there is. Some go to the Ministry of Defense and some go to the foreign office. This phrase, which Blair and Chirac cooked up, was a sort of defense hair, which is still going, but slightly less so, of autonomous decision-making. The words they use, the Union must have the capacity for autonomous action, backed up by credible military forces, the means to decide to use them, and the readiness to do so in order to respond to international crises. Now, they claim that it was John Major's fault for agreeing in the Maastricht Treaty the words common defense, and the then uh, permanent representative for us in NATO put up very strong resistance against it, and rightly so, in my view. But nevertheless, it's all crept in, and the extent to which it is developed is best summed up by these words. So just in case you think it's scaremongering, I'd like you to listen. The French Chief of Defense Staff explicitly laid out the procedure on the 28th of March 2001. If the EU works properly, it will start working on crises at a very early stage, well before the situation escalates. Not bad advice. NATO has nothing to do with this, not just bad advice, ludicrous advice. Goes on, at a certain stage, the Europeans would decide to conduct a military operation. Either the Americans would come or not. Do you think many members of Congress really realize that that is the view of the French and quite probably the view of the majority of the people in European Union defense? Just when they start to realize it will be the moment when we will be going out. They will be going out. So just think of those words. Many of you are military people. You know what that means. That means bugger NATO. Now, in reality, UN defense was sidelined during the period of the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq. It hasn't really loomed, uh, and to some extent even now dealing with ISIL. But just think back to the history. They led with defense on European unity in the early 50s. And then on the 5th of June, 1954, 54, General de Gaulle, out of office, gave one of his rare but influential press conferences, bitterly attacking the very concept of the European defense community. And earlier in 1953, Michel Dupre, speaking in the National Assembly, warned, it is necessary, he said, to tell all the theologians, a well-chosen word, all the theologians of little Europe point blank. Europe is not a nation. It is an aggregate of nations. Europe is not a state. It is a grouping of states. To create Europe, this reality must be taken into account. And it was taken into account until arguably the Maastricht Treaty or the meeting of Chirac and Blair. Now is the time. It was, of course, as you all know, rejected in August 1954 by the French Assembly. Now is the time for Britain in 2016 to show the same resolve and affirm our total support for NATO to the continental Europeans. If they wish, they can carry on with their defense force. I can't stop them, so there's no point in much moaning about it. But let's hope they do meet their pledge to 2% of GDP on NATO entertained and introduced and accepted in Newport two years ago. How many of you believe that Germany will do that in the next three to four years? How many believe that France will do that? It's the smaller countries that are meeting it. It's the smaller countries that are up in 3%. But we all know 3% of a very small budget doesn't mean they have a lot of money for NATO. The fact is that that 2% is designed by the Americans as the test of our resolve and of the special relationship. And on this, I have no doubt Obama speaks for the whole country. 
So let uh, us look to the next thing that we'll hear about, and it'll be after this referendum is over, of course, when the five presidents report. And what's going to be in that five presidents report? Direct elections for the European Commission and direct elections for the European Council. The very job that Tony Blair lobbied Hillary Clinton and the White House for, as we now see through these disclosed emails. I think we can fairly say that uh, Tony Blair wouldn't be offering himself for the job if he didn't think it had increased power. I think that's a modest assumption. So let the politicians remember it was the people of this country in a number of different ways who forced this referendum, as I've said. The campaigns are all party and none. They do not fight on manifestos because they are not choosing a government. The poor old press is behind the game. They're treating this as if it's an electoral uh, challenge like in a general election where each party has a manifesto. Well, I have to tell you, with the best will in the world and the greatest possible comradeship, Boris Johnson, Michael Gove, Gisela Stewart, a number of other Labour MPs, myself, a few ex-Liberal Democrats and others, we ain't signing up for a manifesto. We're signing up for a campaign, which is a campaign involving the people directly in their choice and their vote on one decision. Which direction do we go? Do we go out of the EU and out of all this defense nonsense? Or do we stay with it with a, a prayer? Well, it's up to you. I've said enough. David, thank you very much. A presentation of trenchant and characteristic clarity. Um, we've got a bit more time for questions and comments. Uh, if you put a question or make a comment, uh, though I know many of you, I don't know all of you, so if you could give your name and any um, association that you, or organization you may be connected with. Alan Lee Williams, former <coughs> Labour MP who followed you, David, into the SDP and therefore, in a way, forfeiting any future career, if possible, in, in, in the Labour Party. And the basis of it was uh, that we would try and develop a European foreign security policy. At least that was my position because I'm an Atlanticist. At the time, I was director of the Atlantic Council, so there's no doubt about my, my views, and very unpopular. My views used to be in certain quarters. But I've always looked upon this issue in a, a, a less um, emotional way. I think for the first time, uh, you've made a passionate but also an emotional speech. And I, I, I'll try, try, I'm not going to try and answer that now because you put me in an emotional state. So I'm unable to do it. But you, you, you've told us that we can no longer trust the Americans as allies, a view which I've gradually come round to myself. But if, if we don't trust the Americans and we don't trust the, uh, the, the Europeans, we'll ever develop a proper, a proper European and foreign security policy. Where does that leave us and NATO? Well, I do trust the Americans, and I believe that if there is real commitment and serious European intent, intent, which I believe Britain can mobilize, then they will stay in NATO. If Americans were to switch and overtly support a European defense policy, I would treat it like Britain had to treat European defense through many years past. We keep our defense forces strong. Remember, this country put in 9% of GDP at various post-war years, after the war was over, in order to keep NATO strong. At a time when we were making huge domestic sacrifices in the post-war economy. So I do, I do trust the Americans. And I, all I'm saying is I think the warnings we're having We've had them from every single Secretary of State for Defense in their haul-down reports when they come to Europe, and the most recent was Gates. 
Gates, in his biography, tells us that Rasmussen, I think was then the NATO Secretary General, had told him that the reason the Germans wouldn't come into Libya was because they wanted to do it through the European defense arm. General Ritchie's, in his memoir, makes it perfectly clear that not only Sarkozy was tempted, but wanted that option, but David Cameron was tempted by doing it as a European defense thing. And fortunately, Ritchie's prevailed and said to them, it cannot be done without NATO. And then you hear Gates telling us how they ran out of ammunition and he had to supply it, how the countries didn't, who had voted for it didn't commit any resources. Now, all this is there on the record. I do ask you all to look at it. You won't get much more warning. And it wasn't just Gates, who was arguably Republican, although serving an American president. It was also those who were Democratic uh, defense secretaries who have been warning this. So look at the book. Thank you. Um, Malcolm. Uh, Malcolm Chambers from the Institute. Uh, Dr. Owen, I, I, you, you mentioned the Dutch referendum, which I think we haven't perhaps paid enough attention to, but it does, I think, illustrate the fact that the Euroscepticism we see in this country is also shared by another, a number of our northern European neighbours. And, and my question really is, is twofold. First of all, what is your assessment uh, of uh, the likelihood that a British vote to leave would trigger a similar debate in other neighboring countries, and uh, not only in the continent, the Netherlands, Sweden, and so on, but also, importantly, in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and related to that, what would the UK's interests in such a scenario be? Would it be in our interests uh, for those countries, including the Republic of Ireland, the Netherlands, perhaps France, to remain in the European Union, or would it be in our interest for them to also leave? Well, I'm a no fart these days, so what I think doesn't really matter. But I do think that no British Prime Minister and nobody in authority in a cabinet position will go into any of those European Union countries and say, do as we've done. And I think it would be a democratic disgrace. I can't scoff at the bad advice which uh, uh, the President had to come into an election and argue and otherwise. We all know there's a professional club of politicians that basically accepts you don't interfere with the decisions of other democratic governments and sometimes undemocratic governments to boot. And it works. And we all know you have reservations and they know probably you've got reservations. And sometimes privately, you, if you know them well, you've said it privately, but you don't say it in public. I would not take a single finger because I want that Eurozone saved. So if they want to create a country like it to Holland, which would be a crucial country, because they're the ones who are going to make fiscal transfers with Germany, I don't think there's any chance of Holland pulling out of it, though it's true that the mood of Euroscepticism has grown and grown. But you mentioned this Art Ukraine Association agreement. Let me read a few words out, some of you might not have read. Article 4.1, political dialogue of all areas of mutual interest should be further developed and strengthened between the parties. Fine. This will promote gradual convergence on foreign and security matters with the aim of Ukraine's ever deeper involvement into the European security area. This was reiterated in Article 7.1, which called for convergence in foreign affairs, security and defense. Article 10.03 mentioned conflict prevention, crisis management, military technological cooperation, and went on to state the European Defense Agency will establish close contact to discuss military capability improvement, including technological issues. I tell you, there's nobody who's been in the Kremlin for the last 50 years who would have accepted that. Now, we could got to watch it. I went round, I asked the Germans, and I must say, some of them did have the grace to say there was a little bit too much of the EEAS and a little too less of, of foreign policy. Where was the foreign office, for goodness sake? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lord Owen. Uh, my name's uh, Noel. I'm one of the Institute's members. From the accent, you can see that um, um, I'm an Australian. Um, I'm interested in what other players outside of Europe, 
Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand might think of Britain making the decision to leave in that they have strong strategic defence and foreign policy relationships with Britain, which they cherish? Well, I think New Zealand makes its own uh, foreign policy and defence policy these days. It's no longer a dominion, and no longer, uh, and we would be very foolish to think that their Commonwealth relationship, which will continue, is related. The Commonwealth relationship, apart from within the Commonwealth Secretariat, has its uses, and I would only use that rather neutral term, in the United Nations. And there, even then, they have got, you and New Zealand have linkages and groupings that it would want to do. You can't do what we did to the Commonwealth in the start of this debate, going back in 1962, and expect everything over all these periods. I'm going to Canada next year, and I, uh, next week, and I'll explain some of these issues. But I won't ask for a special relationship for Canada, and particularly not on trade. On trade, it's mutual interest you negotiate about. You can't have it both ways. I say people will do a deal with us because it's mutual interest, because we buy more from them than they buy from us. But I don't believe that there are days of favours. There's probably more open-mindedness of all Commonwealth countries to hear each other out, to listen to the language and to work with each other. And we are very important players with the America on the intelligence arrangements. So in defence and other areas, there is historic links. But I think what your question is aimed at is a, is a decent, absolutely honourable one. We must not think that we can trade back. The situation is not 1940 when we could call on them to come to our help and indeed many ways rescue, take India and other things. So I'm not in that mood. Uh, and I didn't take up my good friend's comments in the front. I do feel emotional about this. I don't make any secret of that. It's not the first emotional speech you've actually heard from me, Alan, <laughs> but uh, I, it may be that my emotions have overcome my intellect. I hope not. But I pride myself on still being trained as a neuroscientist, and I have looked at this very, very carefully. I can tell you a secret. I intended to go to Greece, finish writing a book, which I'm writing about the wartime coalition government of 1940, vote by post, and ignore the whole bloody thing. Uh, my wife smiled whenever I said this, and my children teased me. And eventually it was a visit to Berlin that made me change my mind. When I came to the conclusion, there was no appetite to change the Eurozone. Thank you. Um, we've got rather a lot of hands up. Do you mind taking two or three at yeah. a time? Uh, I'll cluster two or three together. Uh, lady there with a... Yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Selimia Borshasham. I'm from King's College London, or War Studies. Does it work? Um, you mentioned the um, Eastern, uh, European Eastern pa Partnership Program, uh, Ukraine and other countries. Um, even if we keep ourselves in the discourse of real politique and taking into account all the interests of Russia and Kremlin, um, my question is, do you really think that 45 million people in Ukraine who used to live in a democratic country, problematic but democratic country, um, they are ready to come back to Kremlin. And do you think that when Europe gives up Ukraine and tells 45 million people, which is nearly equivalent of England population, and tells these people, go back to Kremlin and obey them, do you really think that it will be safer to Europe, just in real okay. politic discourse. Thank you. And yes, uh, on your right. Anthony, just wondering what, what you would say to young people. You talked about possible disagreements with the children, your mm -hmm. family. What's your message to young people? They want a vision, and they have an idealistic vision of Europe. What do you say to them? And lady in the front row, who's had her hand up for some time. <laughs> Um, uh, and I've been researching the European Union for uh, about 24, 25 years. 
um, and Lord Owen, um, uh, several points, and just to uh, quickly pick up on uh, your quote of the French uh, general. Yes, I mean, it's, it's been a longstanding thing that for, for France, for the French political establishment, certainly, um, rivalry with the USA is a motivating force in uh, uh, everything uh, that they do in the EU. But my, my principal point is uh, something that hasn't uh, come up. I uh, wonder how you would feel about it. Because I've attended several roundtables put on by uh, a London think tank uh, about a, a, um, a, a simulation of what the negotiations will be like and uh, real ministers from various European governments and some important ones uh, were there. And they, they were venomous. Uh, they got carried away with the motion. Uh, for example, the Dutch representative talked about uh, how much Holland loves Britain and then launched into, but there'll be a divorce and it'll be a nasty divorce. And, and you know, the, the love turned into animosity. This happened with the Spanish representative and, and these were real government ministers uh, from various mm -hmm. European countries. And it, it happened at both events. Um, so, and this relates to my principal point, which uh, uh, I really was eager to ask you. I have believed for a long time, and I've been talking to everybody I can get my hands on in important positions, to uh, think about the nuclear option, uh, as it's been told, of um, uh, simply seceding from uh, the EU, uh, asserting parliamentary sovereignty, and uh, abrogating uh, uh, the, the uh, European Communities Act 1972 in Britain's out in a flash and then negotiate from outside because Article 50 gives tremendous power to the EU to impose things on Britain and, and Britain will have no, no rights at all during that period. So I think getting out in a flash is ideal and I think it will appeal to the public. Thank you. Uh, Realpolitik. Uh, well, of course, I'm ashamed of what's happened to Ukraine because we were a signatory to the Belgrade Memorandum and I still consider myself bound by it and with the limitations of language it was not an article 5 commitment but it was a pretty serious commitment to the integrity of their borders and the fact that it's been so flouted is a, almost a death knell to the NPT because you've made it very clear that the old saying if you want to stop being attacked you better have nuclear weapons is true and Ukraine gave back, gave not back, gave away substantial numbers of nuclear weapons and missiles to the Russian Federation. So we cannot forget this. We will not and must not accept the annexation of the Crimea without there being international negotiations. And the sooner they start, the better, because there's a lot of dry tinder around in all this area. Nagorno-Karabakh suddenly come up. Uh, Askazia, uh, South Ossetia, Transnistra and East Ukraine, just to name a few. And I think we should establish P5 plus one and get serious negotiations on all these boundary disputes and hope that within a framework we can get a negotiation, trade-offs, and some stability about the boundaries of Europe. And of course, I consider Ukraine in part a very European country. Unfortunately, there is another part which does look to Russia, is Russian speaking. And that can be resolved and is resolved through devolution and other things in many of our countries. And we're going to have to try to uh, get a settlement there. But you don't get a settlement by the EU putting in three foreign ministers. We never quite discovered whether it was really an EU mission. Signs a compromise agreement. President Obama intervenes to ask uh, Putin to put in a reasonable person as an observer, and eventually he does. And no sooner is the ink dry then we've let the street ditch that agreement. Now, that is not serious diplomacy. If you haven't got that control of events, don't put your name to an agreement. Don't put the whole authority, so-called, of the EU foreign policy down the line on a compromise agreement which you ring up Putin and ask him to agree. And within 24 hours, the elected president, and on the second election, most people think it was a fairly fair election, is out. You've got to watch your step on all this. Politi is real politique. You're talking to a paid-up believer in that. It's not gestures. Now, on the question of vision, this is tricky. Uh, I don't think I win the arguments, but you see, you don't win all arguments. One of my sons is an environmentalist. He tells me quite straight that the environmental policies of the EU are better than the UK. 
to which I say I agree. And I furthermore say, if I was an environmentalist, I would possibly be switched. Because everybody switches by their own interests. If somebody comes and tells you, if you go into the EU, you'll definitely lose your job, you tend to vote to keep your job. Now, come on, we all know. That's what the difficulty about referendums. You are giving personal choice. But it is also the way we've chosen them. Why have we chosen them? As I said, it's as, we're telling MPs, you have to implement this and vote for the legislation. Give up your rights, effectively. And so it's, there are pros and cons to using referendums. It's not a very tricky issue. So I say to my sons, if there is a generation divide, go and persuade your mother. And probably they do, actually. <laughs> so I mean, I, it is tricky. And I suspect many of us face this issue. And I like to be a visionary. And I like to think that I've got the vote of the young. And most of my life I have. I must admit on this I don't uh, at the moment. But then that's the job of the election campaign. And then to the lady about this, um, the venomous nature of it, that's one of the reasons we shouldn't rush into negotiations. We need a little bit of cooling off period. Take the summer. Don't, David Cameron must not be allowed to rush this whole thing. We need careful things and we need to make it clear. Now say, fishing is a good example. We, we claim back the sea but we make it quite clear to them we're prepared to negotiate over fishing and indeed some parts of agriculture. I'm open secret to you that I believe the uh, EEA, as you rightly say, could have been this, we could have settled the whole thing. That would have been the second Europe around the EEA, a wider Europe as well, including Turkey and eventually some of the countries in the Balkans who I'd like to see brought closer to the European Union, but who we dare not yet let come into the EU with, certainly with free movement of labor, and make EEA membership without free movement of labor. And that may be where Britain could still fit in, but they're not going to do it if we have no movement on free movement of labor, no movement on voting rights, and a sort of arrogant assumption that we will be treated like Norway should never have been treated, nor Iceland treated, nor Liechtenstein treated, and how we should be treating uh, uh, Switzerland. So a little realism is going to come in this. And if that has real politique, it is. We are going to have to teach some people that there are forces not within only our country that they have to come to grips with in their own country. We can't tell them how to do it. It's not our job to get into their elections. But don't give me this venomous language from some of these pumped up politicians who can't win elections in their own country on many of these issues, who are afraid to do what they want to do, which is introduce a European state, who haven't got the votes to do it. Now, there is going to be a period of uh, standoff, but I don't think it should be bitterness. I don't think we should retaliate. That may be contemplated at some future date, but very rarely works. But uh, we have the basis of a WTO agreement anyhow, which is ours by right. We can take up our membership of the WTO and then build on it. It's not sufficient on its own, of course not. But you can build in different ways and different things. I don't say it because if I said anything more detailed, uh, number 10 would have some assistant ringing up some assistant in some other country and ask them to denounce that particular option. We know what's happening. We all know. We're all adults. We can see what's happening. It's a scorched earth policy that uh, Prime Minister is conducting. And some people say to me, well, you can't stay. Oh, come on. Politicians are very used to this. They fight elections. They say an awful lot of absurd nonsense in that election, and they settle down and usually forget half their manifestos within a few months. Now, we're used to it. So I don't approve of it, but that's reality. That's the nature of the beast. We have to live with that. They're fighting for their political lives, they think. But again, a referendum allows them not to have to. It's not, they're not going to be turfed out of number 10. The, the, the furniture vans are not going to grow up to me. Cameron is there if he wants to stay there. And I think he, there's a lot to be said for continuity and quite a lot to him to go around to his European friends and say, look, I tried my best. I, 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 I'm, I, you know, I don't want to be in this situation. No, I did my best. I, I think he, I'd like to have him on my team. Whether he should lead the team or how he should lead the team, that's all up to him and up to them. I'm not a Tory. 
in case you haven't noticed. <laughs> Sorry? I asked you to comment uh, on uh, uh, the assertion of parliamentary sovereignty in a vote in Parliament to leave the EU and uh, by. Um, well, uh, we will do that. That is what this is about. No, we are but leaving. doing it the day after, if possible, the referendum and leaving suddenly without negotiating and negotiating. No, we are leaving. We will leave as a result of this referendum. We will then negotiate the path of what happens in certain areas. Some areas are not going to be touched by this at all. I said to you, fishing and agriculture is not part of the EEA. There are lots of other things. We won't be sending members of parliament back to the European election at the next elections. Do we let them stay for a little while until the next election or not? This is something to discuss. Lots of areas which we'll try to reach harmony and peaceful and what suits everybody arrangements. But the, we are leaving. Don't, don't fall for this idea. This is going to be treated like the votes of France and Netherlands on the Constitutional Treaty and you just bring it back in another form. Nor is it going to be treated like the two Irish votes in which they were told to go back and think again or Denmark. This country is making a permanent choice. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. We are getting out of the EU. We will not be in its foreign policy. We will not be in its defense policy. There is no other interpretation unless we are going to suddenly have a form of dictatorship in this country. We have listened to the people. We have given them the choice. If Scotland had voted to come out, of the UK, this referendum was done with the British government's authority, they would now be out. That is perfectly understandable. And don't let think anybody goes, there's an academic professor in Princeton, I've just been there recently, who writes some stuff in the Financial Times a few weeks ago. It was as cloud cuckoo land as a great deal of academic language. He said that the British will do exactly like the French and the uh, Dutch and the Danes and the Irish. We will not. And thank God we won't. I, I want a self-governing nation, thank you very much. It will happen, if we vote for it. I, I don't assume the result. I, I honestly don't know how it's going to happen. I haven't a clue. I hope, but I, I've hoped before and lost. <laughs>